Well, I would like to begin by expressing my sincere appreciation for being invited to present the AACR Distinguished Lectureship in Breast Cancer Research. This is truly an honor for both me and my team. So I have nothing to disclose. Now the AACR Distinguished Lectureship um, is recognizing uh, me for defining the mechanisms of CDK1 activation and inactivation during a normal cell cycle and demonstrating how its activation is prevented by cell cycle checkpoint mechanisms. And then how, how our work and the work of others led to clinical investigations aimed at targeting cell cycle and checkpoint proteins in various cancers. So I thought what I would do for this lecture is take you on my journey from a discovery scientist to a translational breast cancer research, researcher so you can see um, how we made these various contributions. So back in the day, if one was interested in studying cancer, um, one of the great ways to do this was to um, use uh, either DNA or RNA tumor viruses as your model system. And that's because they are um, small. So in my case, um, I studied the transformation of polyomavirus, which um, has a circular double-strand DNA genome of only 5,000 base pairs, and it encodes six genes and the oncogene middle T antigen was known. This is in contrast to human cells, which are much larger, um, have linear genomes with 23 pairs of chromosomes, 3 billion base pairs, and encodes 20,000 um, genes approximately. In addition, at that time, we didn't have all the amazing technologies we have today to really study um, human tumor tissue. So, um, I was tasked with trying to understand how the middle T antigen uh, could take a normal cell and uh, turn it into a cancer cell. And uh, well, I was helped by a publication um, by Sarah Courtnage and Alan Smith about a year before I began my postdoctoral studies. And what they showed was that the middle T antigen bound to cellular SARC. Now, there was no uh, mechanistic insight into how middle T antigen changed SARC, but they did show that this was essential for the ability of middle T antigen to function as a viral oncogene. And so my contributions um, came when I uh, first uh, used a retroviral shuttle vector to generate the first cDNA to cellular SARC. There, there was no cDNA at that time. And this enabled me then to overproduce it in a variety of ways to do the uh, biochemical and molecular characterizations that were required. And so what we were able to show is that middle T antigen by binding to cellular SARC essentially turns it into viral SARC, okay? So the phosphorylation status of SARC changes and it becomes constitutively active as a protein tyrosine phosphatase or kinase, excuse me. The second major um, contribution I made was to start overproducing eukaryotic proteins using the baccaloviral expression system. Um, and I first used this to um, look at the interactions between middle T antigen and cellular SARC. And you're gonna see why the system um, became so important for my later work. So again, um, cellular SARC, uh, was activated upon binding to middle T antigen in a constitutive way. And the idea then was that certain downstream targets would be phosphorylated, and that would then lead to cellular transformation. But normal SARC, um, under normal conditions, is a highly regulated enzyme. And so when a growth factor binds to its cognate receptor, it begins a signaling cascade that activates SARC, um, and SARC then goes on to phosphorylate downstream targets, which ultimately leads to cellular proliferation. So at the time that I was carrying out my studies, um, the cell cycle field had identified CDC2 as a, um, as a protein kinase that was essential for driving cells um, into mitosis. Now, David Beach and Paul Nurse um, showed that CDC2 was phosphorylated on tyrosine. This was tyrosine 15. In addition, David Shalloway's laboratory and Harold Barmas laboratory identified a novel um, phosphorylated form of SARC that was activated in mitosis. 
So it wasn't too far afield to um, hypothesize that perhaps cellular SARC was the kinase that was responsible for phosphorylating CDC2 on tyrosine 15. And so David Beach's lab um, would send me partially renatured CDC2, the human CDC2 that they had overproduced in bacteria and purified out of um, occlusion bodies. And I would incubate it with my um, cellular SARC that I had overproduced in insect cells using a recombinant baculovirus. And lo and behold, I was able to phosphorylate CDC2 on the appropriate site, tyrosine 15. But when I started my own lab, first at Tufts Medical School, I wasn't satisfied with using um, partially denatured or renatured CDC2. And so I decided that I would produce CDC2 in its uh, native form. And again, I did this um, by overproducing human CDC2 in insect cells. And then I gave it to cellular SARC in an in vitro reaction. And lo and behold, there was no phosphorylation of CDC2. Now in science, it's sometimes difficult to accept or believe a negative result. There can be a million reasons why that doesn't work, but SARC is a very promiscuous kinase and I'd yet to find a substrate basically that it wouldn't phosphorylate. And so I believe this negative result and um, believe that there are some defeats more triumphant than victories. So uh, this defeat catalyzed me then to um, go about and start learning about the cell division cycle. So I did a lot of reading in the yeast literature where these important um, cell division cycle mutants were identified um, and I would collect those um, cDNAs encoding those cell cycle regulators. Um, at the time, Joan Ruderman's lab had cloned cyclins A and B and I was able to obtain those. And then in human cells, um, we either obtained various um, cell cycle cDNAs encoding, cDNAs encoding cell cycle regulators from our colleagues or we cloned them ourselves. And we carried out experiments in fission yeast and we used oocytes and eggs from Xenophis levis um, and carried out experiments in tissue culture cells and made knockout mice, et cetera. And importantly, also um, overproduced these proteins in insect cells using this baculoviral expression system in order to really understand the biochemistry of the cell division cycle. So the first major um, discovery that we made was that fission yeast uh, we won was able to phosphorylate CDC2 on tyrosine 15. Now this was somewhat of a heretical finding at the field because the amino acid composition classified we one as a serine threonine protein kinase, not a tyrosine kinase. In addition, we found that fission yeast we one would autophosphorylate on serine and tyrosine residues. And again, this was an unexpected finding because at the time protein kinases could either phosphorylate serine and threonine or tyrosine, but never both. Now, um, the stoichiometry of phosphorylation was pretty low in this reaction, I have to admit. Um, but again, around the same time, the cell cycle field had identified cyclins as regulatory um, proteins that bind to CDC2. And so we um, then overproduced CDC2 in complex with cyclin. And in this case, we were able to stoichiometrically phosphorylate CDC2 on tyrosine 15 strengthening our conclusion that we one was um, going to be a physiologically relevant protein kinase. However, um, Paul Nurse's lab showed that CDC2 was still phosphorylated on tyrosine 15, and even in the absence of we one in fission yeast. So we foraged ahead and we characterized a second protein kinase, MYC1, um, that David Beach had identified in yeast and went on to show that MYC1 and WE1 function redundantly in fission yeast to phosphorylate CDC2 on tyrosine 15. We then moved to higher eukaryotic organisms where we showed that human WE1 and human MYC1 function redundantly to phosphorylate human CDC2. And this occurs on two residues, both threonine 14 and tyrosine 15. MYC1, which we cloned, uh, is a 
a, a dual specificity protein kinase. It phosphorylates CDC2 on both sites, whereas we won phosphorylate CDC2 on tyrosine 15. So uh, we had identified two negative regulators of the complex, um, but clearly when cells um, are ready to move into mitosis, so when they have um, replicated their DNA, they've grown to the appropriate size, and they're ready to enter into mitosis, this complex has to be activated. And so um, we showed that the CDC25s catalyze this reaction. These are dual specificity uh, protein phosphatases that dephosphorylate both residues to generate an active complex. And similar findings were made by the Kirshner and Dunphy labs. So um, if we put this pathway together, um, what we demonstrated was that the CDK1 cyclin uh, B complex um, is acted on by um, three protein kinases, we one MIT1, and CAC. Uh, we one and MIT1 regulate threonine-14 and tyrosine-15 phosphorylation. Other groups identified CAC, which is CDK activating kinase that phosphorylates CDK1 on threonine-161. This is the form of the complex that accumulates throughout the S and G2 phases of the cell cycle. It's inactive. And it's the CDC25s that then dephosphorylate those inhibitory residues to generate the active form that ultimately drives cells into mitosis. Now in fission yeast, there's one CDC25. In humans, there are three. So um, my early career was focused on um, elucidating the biochemistry of the G2 to M phase transition. And then uh, we turned to um, really trying to understand how the regulators are regulated. And we uh, found several mechanisms. I'm not going to go through all these, um, but we found regulation at the level of protein-protein interactions, reversible phosphorylation, subcellular sequestration, and ubiquitin-mediated proteolysis. And so again, we had a nice understanding of how um, this, how cell cycle progression was regulated during a normal cell cycle. There was an additional observation that we made. Um, CDC25A protein phosphatase was thought to um, only function at early cell cycle transitions. And we showed it had a more universal role acting at both early and late cell cycle transitions. So in 1994, I relocated my laboratory to Washington University School of Medicine, where we um, remained for almost 20 years. And there we attacked another important unanswered question in the field. And that is, how does stress in the form of replication stress or DNA strand breaks, these can either be single strand breaks or double strand breaks, how does this form of stress signal to the cell cycle machinery to bring about cell cycle delays. This is what, are, what is known as cell cycle checkpoints. So our first clue came when we were trying to understand how the CDC25C protein phosphatase was regulated. And we identified a phosphorylation site, serine 216. And we showed that uh, CDC25C was phosphorylated on serine 216 um, stoichiometrically throughout interphase, but that site was lost in mitosis. Now, given that mitosis is when we need CDC25C to be active, this result inferred that phosphorylation was going to negatively regulate the function of the phosphatase. But try as we might, we were never able to really find um, a how this phosphorylation regulated CDC25C activity. Um, and then happily one day, I was presenting this work at our cell signaling um, club at WashU and my colleague, Andre Shaw um, was there and he um, spoke up and said, oh my gosh. He said, we have been um, trying to understand how 1433 proteins are targeted to um, cellular proteins. And we have identified a phosphomotif um, that regulates this interaction. And serine 216 fits perfectly within that motif. And so literally within three days, 
we've done an experiment to show that during interphase, CDC 25C was bound to 1433 proteins due to this phosphorylation. And in mitosis, this interaction was lost. So why was this important? Well, it ends up, we went back to the yeast literature and read that 1433 proteins in fission yeast are rad mutants. So now we knew what experiments we had to do to test the function of this um, phosphorylation and 1433 interaction. So we uh, went on to show that 1433 proteins negatively regulate CDC 25C, and that is through uh, basically uh, compartmentalization or sequestration. Um, and we went on to, to um, show a broader role for 1433 proteins. So they negatively regulate CDC 25A and they positively regulate V1. So continuing to try to understand this pathway, we next were interested in identifying the kinase that's phosphorylate CDC 25C on this site, which was so important for um, checkpoint control. And so this led us to um, show that the check one protein kinase is a key um, kinase that um, is important uh, when cells experience replication stress or single strand DNA breaks. And um, we then went on to show that ATR acts upstream of check one. And this pathway is critical for cells to arrest in the S and G2 phases of the cell cycle in response to this type of stress. And so we have this pathway now where single strand breaks or replication stress signal through the ATR check one CDC 25 axis um, to elicit cell cycle arrest in the S and G2 phases of the cell cycle. Now ATR also phosphorylates P53, which uh, transcriptionally upregulates P21, which is a CDK inhibitor. This pathway is essential for the G1 to S phase checkpoint. Now, although P53 is not required to initiate the S and G2 checkpoints, it does reinforce those checkpoints. And so you really uh, lock down uh, the cell division cycle um, when, when they respond to this type of stress. And it gives them time to try to uh, repair any DNA damage before proceeding um, through the cell division cycle. Now, ATM, is activated by DNA double strand breaks. And it ends up that you know, DNA double strand breaks can, can, can be converted to single strand breaks and single strand breaks can be converted to double strand breaks. So you generally activate um, all of these pathways um, in response to this type of stress. All right, so um, uh, I think most of you know that inhibitors targeting the cell cycle and checkpoint proteins are now approved or in clinical testing for cancer. And so this is really gratifying um, to me personally and to other members of the cell cycle and checkpoint field. Um, and so to uh, borrow a quote from Eugene Kennedy, um, quote, to feel that one has contributed to this splendid enterprise on however small a scale is reward enough for labor at the end of the day. So, um, how then did my lab go about taking advantage of our basic understanding of cell cycle control and checkpoint control for targeting cancer cells? So our interest in this area was piqued when we became aware of some work being conducted at the NCI um, by Patrick O'Connor and Ed Salsco. So um, they were carrying out, I mean, the NCI was carrying out big screens um, with various drugs. And they had done um, an important screen. And so what they did was they um, took uh, cancer cells, these were in 2D cultures, um, treated them with DNA damaging agents, and then came in with ucn one which is a protein kinase inhibitor, originally identified as a PKC inhibitor. And what they found is that they could then prematurely activate CDC2 and drive cells into um, a premature mitotic cell death. But interestingly, this occurred in P53 deficient tumor cells. So we said, well, we know how CDK1 is regulated. Let's see if we can find the target of ucn one So given that it's a protein kinase, we asked, hmm, would it inhibit we one or MIT1? 
And it ends up the IC50s were way too large for those to be meaningful targets of ucn one But once we identified the, ch the check one pathway, we were quickly able to show that ucn one is a very potent inhibitor of check one. And by inhibiting check one, um, cells cannot inactivate CDC25 during a checkpoint response. And therefore, CDC2 becomes activated prematurely and this can induce um, cell death. So this led to a rationale for um, preclinical and um, ultimately clinical trials. And the rationale goes like this. So in normal cells that have a P53 intact pathway, as well as the ATR check one pathway, if you induce genotoxic or replicative stress, you activate these checkpoints, which are very efficient at locking down the cell division cycle in order to give the cell time to deal with this stress. However, in a cancer cell that lacks the P53 pathway, they are unable to arrest at the G1S phase of the cell cycle, but the ATR check one pathway is intact. And so they can initiate an arrest at the S and G2 phase of the cell cycles. Cell cycle. So if you were to come in with a check one inhibitor, you would now blast through all of these checkpoints and observe preferential killing of P53 deficient cancer cells. And we saw this in a number of experiments performed both in tissue culture cells, as well as in PDX um, models of breast cancer. So this is really an early example of synthetic lethality. And so this led then to a phase one trial that um, we started at WashU. And in this trial, 25 patients with metastatic cancer were treated um, with arinotecan and ucn one And now I want to remind you, um, these studies were done at a time when there were no selective check one inhibitors. So, um, you know, ucn one was uh, really the only check one inhibitor available at the time for these trial, for this trial. So 60% of patients had a clinical response, either partial response or stable disease. And four out of four patients with triple negative breast cancer showed some improvement. So there were partial responses observed in two patients and stable disease observed in the other two. And here's an example of one patient that had um, a lesion on her chest wall. And you can see after three cycles of treatment, this uh, cancer basically disappeared. This is a second patient where you can see the same thing. Um, the, the tumor um, cells on her uh, back really responding after two cycles of treatment. And so we thought, well, can we you know, think about this? And it ends up triple negative breast cancer, you all know is a high frequency of P53 mutations and a high frequency of P10 loss. And it ends up UCN01 is a potent inhibitor of CHECK1, we showed that, and others showed PDK1. And so we thought, well, perhaps this is the reason that um, the drug, this combination is working in patients with triple negative breast cancer. So we were able to do some correlative studies and we're able to show that partial responses in the two patients um, with TMBC, their tumors were both mutant for P53. Progressive disease observed in a patient with ER positive disease, um, P53 was wild type in this tumor. Gamma H2AX staining, which detects double-strand DNA breaks, was observed in biopsy samples, demonstrating that arinotecan induced DNA damage in the tumors, and reduced phosphorylation of ribosomal protein S6 in tumor biopsies at 24 hours post-UCN01 indicated tissue bioavailability of the drug, and this was likely due to PDK1 activity. Um, and, in a, and the tumor responses we observed correlated with P53 status, not phospho S6 status. So this then led to um, a phase two clinical trial. Um, again, patients were treated with arinotecan and ucn one on the same 42-day cycle. Um, unfortunately, however, the overall response and the clinical benefit um, was not really that great. And so it was at this point in my career where I realized that I had an opportunity to really try to use um, all of the um, information that we had um, and the discoveries we had made in, this, in terms of the cell cycle and checkpoint control um, for the benefit of cancer patients. And so this is when I decided to relocate my research program to MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, 
And that's because we could now align our studies with um, the breast medical oncology group and really align our studies with ongoing clinical trials. And so I want to describe a couple of these activities. And one of the trials that um, we aligned with was the Artemis trial. And um, Stacy Mulder was the PI of this trial. And I know many of you are aware of this trial. It's been presented at this meeting before. Um, but in this trial, women with newly diagnosed triple negative breast cancer um, are enrolled. And we obtain a tumor sample um, from um, these treatment naive patients. The patients then go on to receive four cycles of adriamycin and cyclophosphamide. And if at the end of that treatment, they have residual disease, we obtain samples. They then either go on standard of care or a variety of phase two trials. And at the time of surgery, when their RC RCV status is being assessed, we get samples. And then finally, the protocol has been approved for patients that come back with metastatic disease. So we built a collection of 92 patient-derived xenograph models. And we, we really believe this is going to be of great value to the field because we have 70 um, from patients, treatment-naive tumors. And this is really important for our work because we're very interested in understanding mechanisms of um, treatment-naive drug resistance or drug resistance in the um, treatment-naive setting. And we know once a, a, a patient is treated with therapy, their tumors go through a lot of evolution. In addition, we have um, serial samples from patients um, for our studies. Uh, the second trial was done with Jennifer Litton. Uh, this was a neoadjuvant telezoparib trial. So uh, in this case, women with um, known deleterious BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutant tumors are enrolled. 20 patients participated in this trial. Um, they went, we obtained samples prior to any treatment. They then um, went through six months of telezoparib treatment, and we were able to get um, tumors, tumor samples if they had residual disease. And so we've been using these models. Um, we've conducted barcode mediated clonal tracking to study metastasis and drug resistance. Um, we are using imaging mass cytometry to understand the spatial and compositional heterogeneity of breast cancer. We're performing single cell RNA-seq um, to study drug resistance and metastasis. Um, we have high throughput drug screening platforms that are ongoing. And of course, we have the corresponding patient tumor specimens for analysis and validation. And so a major goal of our current research is to understand the contributions made by all forms of heterogeneity to breast cancer development and progression in order to identify and target mechanisms of chemotherapy resistance in TNBC, identify and target drivers of breast cancer metastasis, define mechanisms that drive progression from in situ to invasive breast cancer, and identify and overcome mechanisms of breast cancer resistance to PARP inhibitors. And I um, give you an example of some of our publications um, in case you're interested in reviewing our current work. So I'd like to stop here and acknowledge all of the wonderful um, people that have contributed to this work over the years. Uh, this is my current team at MD Anderson, a group of wonderful trainees and staff that are completely dedicated to make a difference in breast cancer. Uh, this is uh, my early group that gave me my start at Tufts Medical School and Harvard Medical School. And I'd like um, to make a, a special call out to the late David Livingston and the le late Jim Maller. I mean, they were amazing mentors to me, amazing collaborators, and great friends, and I miss them dearly every day. Uh, this is my team at Washington University School of Medicine, our trainees and our important collaborators. And then we have the MD Anderson and Houston ecosystem. I mean, it really does take a nation to try and impact breast cancer. And, um, we just had wonderful interactions um, at MD Anderson, as well as Baylor College of Medicine, and UT Health, and um, Texas A&M. And I wish I had time to really um, go through the important uh, contributions and collaborations I've had. But I would like to um, call out at this point the patients who kindly donate their tumor tissue for research. And I'd like to just end with this quote by Gertie Corey. So what she said was, as a research worker, 
the unforgotten moments of my life are those rare ones, which come after years of plotting work, when the veil over nature's secret seems suddenly to lift, and when what was dark and chaotic appears in a clear and beautiful light and pattern. So I look forward to continuing our work with the breast cancer community aimed at lifting the veil of breast cancer's dark and chaotic nature. So again, I wanna thank you for your attention. And once again, um, I'm very grateful for being able to um, deliver this uh, distinguished lectureship today. Thank you very much.